where you can use it to like, um, access historical data on Ethereum. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you guys continue your journey in ZK uh, technology, uh, at some point in time, you will definitely be running code like written by Yi Sang. So we are uh, very excited to uh, have him talk about uh, the, the circuits uh, and the techniques that they're using uh, with this axiom, within Axiom. So without further ado, I will like uh, transfer this to, to Yi Sang. Thanks for the invitation to speak today. Really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I'll start off by just giving an overview of what we do at Axiom. And with the view of highlighting the type of operations we have to actually verify as a And then I'll give a walkthrough of how we think about building these circuits to accomplish those goals and then the concrete implementation. And let's see if the slide advance works. Cool. So just to set the stage, uh, the problem that we're solving at Axiom is that all smart contracts today are uh, what we call data starved, meaning that they really just can't access that much data because it's the most expensive operation in the EVM. Uh, just to give a simple example, if you go to the listing page for a Pudgy Penguin on OpenSea, you actually find that only one piece of data on the page is accessible to a smart contract. Uh, that would be the current owner of the Pudgy Penguin. Whereas all the historic transactions in this first state, like the previous owners, uh, are not accessible to contracts. And this is not just a quirk of Ethereum. Um, it's a property that's necessary for any blockchain that wants to ensure decentralized validation. Uh, because access of contracts to historic states translates directly to the validating nodes needing to be archived nodes. So as a consequence of this, today developers really just trade off between paying more to store more data in the state. Uh, this gives some negative externality to every user of their app and really only scales to some extent, or reducing the security of their app to some extent by using a trusted word. Uh, of course, this introduces some additional assumptions that their users need to make. And again, it can't scale because users need to verify these trust assumptions which is difficult in a composable context. And so the question that we're tackling at Actium is how to scale data access and compute for smart contracts. Um, our starting point here is that the core property of blockchains is the current block actually commits to all past blocks and all states uh, committed to within that. That means that we can use cryptographic decommitment to prove valid access to data instead of verifying that access uh, within consensus. So how does this work? Uh, if we start with the current block, we can prove that a past block was actually within the history of the chain by verifying a Ketchak chain of block headers. That is, checking that the Ketchak hash of a previous header actually appears as the parent hash in a present header. Once we've established validity of a past block, we can give try proofs of different sort of blocks, transactions, or receipts into the block. Now, the challenge here is that we can't actually do this within the EVM because verifying these proofs is pretty expensive. Uh, if we want to verify a block one million blocks ago, of course, that requires exhibiting a million intermediate block headers, and that's beyond the capability of the EVM. Uh, but also, these merkle push try proofs are already quite expensive. So this isn't really an approach that's uh, viable just natively in the EVM. On the other hand, if we take this whole operation and perform the validation in zero knowledge, then we can use the succinctness property of a zero knowledge proof uh, to obtain something that can be verified much more cheaply on Ethereum itself. And so this lets us scale these operations as well as compose them with other operations that we might just not verify the context. So at Axiom, what we're building, uh, as Kassif mentioned, is a ZK code processor for Ethereum that bundles up these operations. Namely, users can query into our contract uh, to request two types of things. One is historic on-chain data reads, and the second is verify compute over those reads. At the end of the day, we bundle those together get to a result 
and generate a zero knowledge proof that that result is actually valid. And those will be the proofs uh, whose certain components I want to talk about later today. Uh, yeah, like uh, one, one uh, comment, like because it seems you are breaking for several of us. Uh, maybe if you turn off video as well uh, to to help us uh, the light. Oh yeah. Uh, is this better? Can you hear me? Ah uh, yes, yes. I mean, like it was getting better, but like it was it was, it was like a lot. It, it was a lot flaky. So maybe like yeah. let's yeah. Take no worries. Uh, yeah, definitely let me know if that continues. Um, cool, yeah. So, so at the end of the day, we get to a result and we generate proof that that result is actually valid. Uh, that requires validating the computation as well as the historic data limits. And give the results to a downstream contract to use. To so be more, uh, a bit more specific, uh, what we're offering is reads to these you know, five types of historic on chain. Uh, data types. Um, and together, these comprise essentially all types of on chain data in theory. And then we allow users to specify custom ZK circuits to process this data for their application needs. Okay, so this is sort of the end goal of ZK for Axie. And next, I'll talk about what are the specific statements that need to be proven in ZK to achieve this goal, uh, since it's not quite obvious what a ZK data review is. So the first question is, what is the root of trust for a data read in ZK? And for us, um, I mentioned earlier that we always root trust in a recent block hash that the EVM can access natively just through the block hash opcode. Now, uh, if we just use that, accessing a very old block hash would be kind of expensive. We'd have to prove the Ketak chain of block headers from the current block all the way back to a very high level. So instead, what we do is we actually maintain a cache in ZK on, on chain that is a commitment to all past block caches of Ethereum back to Genesis. And we keep this in a Merkle Mountain range data structure uh, that allows us to commit to all the block caches in the history of Ethereum in a very small amount of data. Um, and what we need to do is continually keep this Merkle Mountain range updated. Um, as new blocks appear. Uh, once we have this cache, we can prove into it using ZK. So how do we maintain this uh, cache of local map ranges? Well, as new historic block headers appear, uh, what we need to do is prove that they validly form a chain and then append to the Merkle map range. So we actually do the appending in EDM. Uh, so that it's maximally transparent. But for proving the chain of historic block headers, what we need to do is check for a chain of headers that the catch hash in the first one appears in the second one, the catch hash in the second one appears in the third one, and so on. After we've done that, we also need to uh, bundle up this information in some sort of commitment to all the headers which appear here. So some sort of Merkle roots of the headers in each group. So the way we concretely do that is we generate individual proofs for groups of 128 headers. And then we do an operation called aggregation, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later, that combines proofs for, uh, combines adjacent proofs and gets a combined aggregate proof uh, for a group, a, a larger group of headers. So in this case, we would start with weak proofs of 128 headers, um, get to proofs of 256 headers, 512 headers, and finally uh, up to 1,024 headers. And that's actually the proof that we'll verify on the EVM and use to update our more complex image. I saw a question in the chat, and definitely feel free to uh, add more. Um, the question is, what is a input? The answer is just um, you know, a commit. What that to do is to check that any piece of data in the commitment is valid by providing some witness data. Uh, and that process of doing that is called DQ. Okay, so the first type of operation we need to do in ZK is this check of a Kefak header chain of block headers. 
Um, now, the second type of thing we need to do is, uh, as Anza asks, how do we ensure these headers are correct? All right, so that's a great question. So what we're actually doing is checking that we know some of the reasons uh, header is correct. Then the proof will check that the past headers are correct. And the reason is that each header actually commits to the previous header. Uh, just because there's a field in the header called parent hash, which is the hash of the previous header. So if we can check that the hash of, for example, the second to last header appears in the first header, then what that means is that if we agree that the first header is correct, then all previous headers are correct. So we're always rooting trust in some quantity, and for us, it's always going to be essentially the most recent uh, header. Okay, so let's now move on to once we have this Merkle Mountain range, um, how do we actually access uh, historic data from it? Um, so this is the part about doing Merkle, which is try proofs into that cache. Now, again, we're going to verify these proofs in the DK. Uh, so what that means is we need to take a Merkle path. And in this case, because it's a Merkle Patricia try, this is a bit more complex than standard Merkle proof, but the concept is the same. So we have certain leaves and nodes. And the process of verifying a MPT proof is simply verifying certain caches of serialized versions of those nodes and checking if they match certain data points in uh, different nodes along that work path. And so just to illustrate uh, a bit more concretely, uh, within every block header, there are commitments to three Merkle push to try uh, tries. So there's the state root, which commits to the account try. Uh, there's the transactions root and the receipt root. Uh, within the account root, uh, within each account, there's the stored root, which commits to the storage try. Each of these tries is a uh, degree 16 try, um, and there's a pretty specific serialization structure that is used within Ethereum for RP encoding, uh, where all of the nodes are canonically stored um, in the serialization structure. Uh, so our task to prove, for example, the value of slot zero in this account one, two, three, four, is we have to prove that the key value pair zero comma zero x eight zero actually lies in the storage tribe with this claimed storage root. We then have to prove that this storage root lies in the account uh, 0x1234, and that this account actually lies in the state. And so these are the operations that we need to accomplish within ZK. Okay, so so far we've talked about how we root trust for data reads and how we actually perform data reads relative to that root of trust. Uh, finally, I want to talk about our architecture for actually enabling custom compute. So we essentially have two steps. Uh, the first is that the user will specify their computation um, and generate actually a proof for that computation, which is subject to the conditional validity of on-chain data requests that they are making. Uh, we will then plug in to the previous system, which generates proofs for the on-chain data, generate an aggregate proof of both of these statements and verify that proof on-chain. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details of how this works in the rest of the talk. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is that we are using something called universal aggregation to combine these two proofs. Uh, what that means is that we'll take in two proofs, proof of the uh, compute conditional on data access and proof of the data access, and combine them in this aggregation circuit, which can handle any combination of circuits relative to certain constraints. Uh, the output of this aggregation is going to be a proof that can be verified on chain, plus some circuit metadata, uh, which for some reason is not rendering. Uh, but imagine here there is an information claim. So this is some data which identifies which circuits were aggregated. What this means is that we actually have a single verifier contract on chain, which can handle any ZK circuit. Okay, 
so, so far we've talked about what Axon does um, and how we accomplish or what's needed to accomplish each of those goals within ZK. So now I'll talk about what we need from a ZK framework to actually accomplish these goals. And so I'm decreasing the level of abstraction as we go. And at the end, I'll talk about how we actually use ZK circuits to meet the needs of this framework. So when we think about ZK, we really think about uh, the hierarchy of framework needs in three levels. Um, so the most basic level is just basic circuit primitives. Uh, so of course, um, at the lowest level of any computer system, you are implementing stuff by hand to accomplish really basic building blocks. So these would be things like basics arithmetic and bit operations, uh, things like range check and comparisons, and also conditionals and indexing and tool breaks. Uh, so these are fundamental building blocks for essentially any computer system. Uh, and within ZK, there's sometimes some performance trade-offs in how exactly you implement these. But I think the scope for innovation here is not huge. Now, in addition to this, we will use these basic building blocks to build into slightly more advanced circuit primitives. So here, there's a bit more scope for manual optimization um, and also a little more scope for error. So I think the basic building blocks are so simple, it's maybe hard to make them safe. Um, but these advanced primitives include things like serializing and deserializing more complex data structures, uh, doing big integer arithmetic, and eventually non-native modular arithmetic to enable different elliptic curve cryptography operations. So things like uh, MSM, signature verification, and parity. So all of these uh, typically can be built on top of these basic building blocks. And sometimes it's pretty difficult to handle, so it is important to have an optimized search. And I would say that the elliptic curve operations are probably some of the most security critical pieces. And finally, it's also important to have some other pretty advanced circuit primitives, like uh, catch up hash, SHA-256, or Poseidon. Um, essentially, because we're dealing so much with cryptographic operations, um, having hash functions available in a performance-optimized way is very important so that we can do commitment and decommitment. Um, in general, our perspective is that we like to put these operations in separate circuits that simply output a valid table of input-output pairs. Uh, for example, for Ketchak, we'll have as the public inputs and outputs of a circuit simply the pairs of input, comma, catch of input uh, for a list of inputs we care about. And we'll use that as the base building block for later circuits. Okay, so so far we've you know, done handwritten circuits for base building blocks, built out some advanced primitives like serialization, uh, elliptic curve operations, and hashes, uh, kind of using those or from scratch. Um, now, once we're armed with this toolbox, um, our perspective is that we can start writing application circuits. So by application, we think of circuits that are actually relevant for a user's application. Um, so this would encompass things like RLP parsing of data structures in Ethereum. So RLP is a variable length data structure that is used for essentially everything in Ethereum. Um, proving the catch act chain of block counters that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, so that involves RLP encoding and decoding the block headers, and then using the catch a hash function that we built into a table on the previous slide. Uh, Merkle Patricia's try inclusion, again, that's a combination of catch a hash, um, RLP encoding and decoding, and also uh, array selection. And using all of these, we can build account storage transaction and receipt groups. Um, one critical uh, optimization that I want to mention is that we frequently will, we will use a construction where you take basic primitives and allow them to call in to the hash tables that I just mentioned. So these tables can either be in the same circuit or we allow them to actually live in different ZK circuits and use an operation called cross circuit dynamic lookup to connect them. And this is important to maintain both the performance and modularity of our circuits. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So at, once you get to this level, 
you're really thinking more about the programming logic of your application than the low-level details of your circuits. Um, essentially, in building all of these, um, I think we don't really think at all about the low-level structure of the polynomial constraints, and instead are just thinking about application logic. Okay, so the most, probably the last step and arguably the most important is this opera operation of aggregation. So within our Halo 2 based uh, electric current based system, uh, we use non native aggregation. Um, so aggregation is an operation which allows you to take multiple ZK proofs, uh, recursively verify that they are correct, subject to the verification of a certain pairing check. Pairing check. Um, and then do a bit of computation on top that's verified in ZK. Um, so as you might tell from the description, which is already a little bit complicated, what you need to do is actually implement the Z part of the ZK verification algorithm um, in ZK itself. And when you compile that for uh, a KZG-based system, you'll see that you need to do non-native MSM and also verify a bunch of hash functions, uh, usually using a side. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we actually extend this to something called universal aggregation, which allows us to aggregate variable proofs against variable verification keys. And so this allows us to handle different circuit sizes um, and actually outputs a commitment to the verification keys that we use. Now, I want to mention that there are different levels of universality that are possible. And some of them, including the ones one we use, uh, do require some constraints on the circuit layout and gates. So what that means is that you'd be able to aggregate um, circuits with a certain type of layout or gates, but not fully general. And the upshot of this is that we can enable multiple aggregation layouts that verify against the same verifier. And that's valuable if that verifier is being deployed on chain. OK, so that's sort of what aggregation is and how we can make it universal. And what we use it for is to actually create more complex uh, application circuits. So I mentioned earlier we have these individual application primitives, like a MPT proof or a, uh, a block header catcher. Now, ultimately, what we care about is more complex application circuits. Uh, maybe we want to do several MPT proofs, combine them into a storage proof or a transaction proof, and then do some operations on top of those results. Um, so to keep a level of abstraction, we prefer to break down all these applications uh, into individual application circuits, and then combine them and do the, the overall computation within an aggregation circuit. Uh, this enables us to do two things. First, there's a bit more abstraction in where the application circuits live. And second, it allows us to delegate uh, the complex operations to external tables, uh, for example, the catch up table uh, that can be separately optimized and whose proof generation can actually be run on different computers. Uh, so just to talk a little bit more about how that works, um, just what we're, what we're doing is basically taking all indications of the catch up hash, aggregating them into a list and proving their validity in the same catch up table circuit. Um, now, when we actually want to read those hashes, what we do is we take a commitment to the catch up input output pairs that's output from the catch up circuit and passing that commitment between application circuits. So this commitment would simply be a public uh, input for each application circuit. Within the application circuit, we would read from that commitment and then use dynamic lookup to ensure that all invocations of uh, catch up are actually correct. And finally, within aggregation, we would check that the commitment output by the catch up table is actually the same as the commitment used in every application circuit. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest benefits of this is that we can prove the catch up table in a totally different machine than all the application proving is happening. Uh, one example you might uh, of where that might be helpful is that the app, the machine doing the uh, catch up proving might be using hardware acceleration, whereas the machine doing everything else might not. Cool. 
So, so far I've talked about what we're doing, um, what application level operations we need to do, and what concerns we have for our ZK framework to actually accomplish uh, those applications. And so finally, I want to talk about, at a concrete level, how do we actually write circuits to do all these operations? OK, so we separate our libraries essentially into three pieces. First, we have a, we're using Halo 2, which is a proof system that was originally built by Zcash and then forked by the Ethereum Foundation to add a KZG backend. Um, we built a, I guess, embedded DSL for Halo 2 um, in this library, Halo 2 base. So this is both a framework for writing circuits within Halo 2 with a very opinionated layout, as well as a pretty complete set of basic gadgets for Halo 2. And on top of that, we built an elliptic curve library, as well as a library for serialization and reads from Ethereum data structures. And so here we're using a bunch of external dependencies as well. So we take the Keta hash function that's used in the ZKVM project. Um, and also we take the um, aggregation circuit and on-chain EVM verifier from Snark verifier. But this is also used in the ZKVM project, but also but was built more broadly by the uh, privacy scaling explorations team at the Ethereum Foundation for usage in Halo 2. Okay, so let me now finally talk to uh, talk through at the lowest level uh, how we're actually accomplishing these primitives. And so hopefully this can finally connect to uh, the section earlier in this talk about the goals of this framework. So what we do in the Halo 2 base is use a single vertical gate. And so what that means is that we always take the, uh, we always put all of our witness values into a grid. And within each column, uh, we use a single custom gate. So that gate is gonna be just A plus B times C uh, equals D within a section of four vertical cells. Okay, so you can see on the right, if I'm picking um, the selector column to be the second column and the advice column to be just the first column here, then when we do the dot product of one comma three with two comma four, uh, we can overlap uh, groups of four cells. So the first four cells and the last four cells would overlap by one cell, and that somehow saves um, one cell in the computation of the stock. Okay, so we use this totally homogeneous gate structure to implement all basic gadgets in all elliptic curve uh, operations. Uh, so this is pretty opinionated. It definitely uses very little of the power of potential power of Halo 2, but we found that it offers a very convenient interface as well as achieves really good performance on the elliptic curve side. Um, so one feature that is present in the library is that because every column is totally homogenous, um, once we've decided which selectors we want to turn on and off for this basic gate, uh, what we can do is just take the uh, take the basic gates and allocate them completely uniformly across the columns. Um, so what that means is that if we have a target number of columns or a target number of rows, we can choose a number of rows or number of columns to facilitate the target number of the other. And that allows us to configure a circuit with many columns and fewer rows or fewer columns and many rows. And this allows us to configure circuits that either are fast to prove and more expensive to verify, or um, slower to prove and cheaper to verify. Uh, and this sort of flexibility is actually really important for the aggregation we're going to do later. And so using this library and just this single basic gates, uh, we built up the basic gadgets, including inner product, uh, range check, array indexing, bitwise operations, and comparison operations. So these are sort of the foundational, foundational primitives of any type of compute system. And we tried pretty hard, but for some reason within Halo 2, we do feel like this basic gate is the best way to do this.
Um, and I want to mention just one, oper one optimization, which is that we really try to minimize the usage of lookup arguments. In fact, we, every time we do a lookup, we actually copy the relevant lookup values to a special column that has lookup enabled. And we disable lookup everywhere else. Um, it turns out that lookups add a huge number of virtual columns to the circuit. And we found that by using these special lookup arguments um, to reduce them, we can really uh, reduce the improvement speed of our circuit. All right, so through these operations, we sort of build up all the basic operations in, in Halo 2 base. And on top of that, we build out our elliptic curve operations in Halo 2 ECC. Um, I, I now want to highlight just a couple conceptual um, operations that are needed to extend all of this to the data structure uh, serialization and deserialization that's at the heart of Axiom. Um, so there's essentially two core concepts. Uh, the first is the usage of in-circuit randomness. Um, so what that means is that after committing to part of the circuit, um, the in-circuit randomness or challenge API allows us to draw a random challenge and use it as a witness value in the rest of the circuit. And in the case of the uh, random linear combination, the thing we're going to use it for is to take an array and define its RLC. So that's going to be a, that's written in this formula here. That's just simply going to be something that records the length of the array, as well as some polynomial in the randomness whose coefficients are the uh, entries in the array. And this has the ability that if the RLC of two arrays is the same, then the two arrays are actually the same. And so we're going we're to actually enforce this computation within ZK and check the array quality in this way. And so this gives us very cheap text for both array quality and subarray concatenation. And finally, the last concept I want to mention from, uh, for serialization and deserialization is the usage of dynamic lookups. Um, so a dynamic lookup is kind of similar in API to a standard lookup. So it's going to constrain inclusion of a tuple of entries in our circuits into a dynamically defined uh, lookup table. Uh, so in this picture here, in the bright green, here's a tuple that we're saying actually lies within this dark green table here. And so the crucial thing here is that the entries in the table are defined on a per circuit basis. Um, and what that means is that, in particular, they could be a decommitment of a commitment that's passed around from another circuit. In our case, the uh, commitment would be a commitment to a set of valid catch-act input-output pairs. And the decommitment would say, hey, the, the first element in the decommitted tuple would be the catch-act preimage, and the second element would be an encoding of the catch-act uh, result. And so what this allows us to do is to actually read values of catch uh, evaluations from an external table. And so as I discussed earlier, this is some, something that's really important for making our application level circuits much more logical. All right, so that's a pretty, pretty much an overview of all the ZK work we're doing at Axiom today to enable the full product. Um, so if you want to check out what that product actually is, you can check out our docs at docs.axiom.xyz or join our technical discussion on Telegram. And finally, just at the end, wanted to give a quick plug for a browser-based tool we recently built out called Halo 2 REPL uh, that lets you try out Halo 2 proofs in the browser using a JavaScript interface. I'm happy to stay on to take any questions. And yeah, I want to just open the floor for that. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was like really, really interesting. Uh, I saw there were like some questions in the chat, which I think you have answered already. Um, so maybe like one question from me. Uh, so from like the application level, 
uh, circuits, do people have to use uh, like you know your your abstractions and like you know define everything operationally, or you give them kind of like a more declarative way of like describing things? Yeah, so I would say one of the things we spent a lot of time working on is that we. So maybe there's kind of this question. The most abstract way is that we provide a set of primitives that people can use, and mm -hmm. you can actually access most of them in the browser uh, that that allow you to define as a case circuit. Um, you still need to know a little bit about the concept of VK, uh, but I think there's no thinking about low-level gates or constraints. That's all abstracted away. Um, the second thing we really try to optimize for is to allow people who do want to do that and write raw circuits to also plug into the same framework. And that mm -hmm. actually required quite a bit of uh, framework level. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Uh, I was just like thinking of like, you know, in terms of like, uh, you know, optimizing things like, you know, from an application perspective, right? Like, you know, right now I, I would probably need to like understand a lot of of what's going on uh, beneath, like you know, the the abstraction layer to see, like you know, whether my my query is going to be expensive or uh, or not. Um, oh, I I understand. Um, one thing we found is actually that yeah. if you actually profile the system, um, mm -hmm. the expense of uh, operation is almost entirely contained within hash function evaluation and signature evaluation, mm -hmm. and and so we we found that actually. For almost everything else, it's probably it's better to prioritize abstraction over just performance optimization. Okay, that's that's good to know. <laughs> um, all right, any any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I um, what is uh, you know I think he already answered, but I still I'm still confused about the decommitment process. If we can go over a little bit on that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the decommitment process, you know, actually has nothing to do with ZK. It's just the concept in cryptography. Um, and so the idea is that if you, for example, have some data and you take its hash, then the hash is a commitment to that data, and in particular to any subset of that. Data. Um, so if you exhibit the witness data in the hash, so in the hash preimage. So let's say you have a hash with like two numbers, so A and B, and you want to prove that A is committed to the hash. Then to decommit the hash, you would have to supply both A and B and check that the hash of A and B is actually equal to your claim hash. So that would be the procedure to decommit A. So it's kind of like a verification in a way, right? Or Yeah, yeah that's right, it's a verification. OK, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we we already run out of uh, you know be, we already run behind schedule. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Yisan for his time. Uh, that was like really interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys like tomorrow for more lectures from us and more uh, uh, more guest lectures. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.